Hey guys, my name is Tom, and welcome back to another devlog for my still unnamed pirate game. In this devlog, I'd like to prevent waves from slicing through islands, and I'm going to make it possible to repair your ship when it's damaged. I also got a new mic recently, so hopefully there's a noticeable improvement in audio quality compared to previous videos. It's been almost three weeks now since the last devlog, and during that time I haven't really done much with this project. Instead, I've been working towards getting my new and improved networking solution into a usable state, and over the last three days I've finally converted the pirate game to use that instead of my old network code. Many of you have probably seen my networking tutorials, and it's quite likely that that's actually how you found my channel, so I quickly want to clear up a few things because I already know that if I don't, I'll end up answering the same questions in the comments over and over again. Then again, all those comments would be great for the algorithm but I think it's still best if I save us all some time here. In case you're not particularly interested in the networking stuff, I'll put a timestamp on screen here that you can skip to. Anyways, the main difference between the netcode from my tutorial series and the new stuff is that I've completely removed the TCP portion. Obviously, games still need to be able to send information reliably, so I've added a reliable layer on top of UDP which can ensure that packets get delivered. Additionally, I've made the whole thing more modular so that you can more easily start multiple connections from within the same program, which should make setting up stuff like inter-server communication more straightforward. The whole thing should also run more efficiently, although there's still a bunch of other things I want to optimize. Now, if you've watched my networking tutorials in the past, you might be wondering when you can get your hands on the new code, and honestly, I don't really know yet. I still have a pretty big list of things I need to add and change, not to mention that I'll have to clean it all up before I make it public. I also need to do a lot of testing because there's still any number of things I could have overlooked, and after all that I'll need to actually put together a video, so it's probably going to take a few more months. If you haven't yet watched my existing tutorials, but they sound like something you might be interested in, I wouldn't worry about starting that series now and having to switch later, because the way you actually make use of the netcode will remain very similar. I'll probably also keep recommending the old series even once I get a video out for the new stuff, because I don't plan to go into the low level code as much. Anyways, with that out of the way, I think I'm going to flatten the waves around islands. I've been wanting to do that for a long time, and over the months several people have pointed out that the way the waves currently cut through islands looks terrible, and uh, yeah. I completely agree, this just looks absurd. The way I've set up my water, the buoyancy of objects and the graphical representation of the waves are actually entirely separate. They simply use the same underlying formula. I'll start by visually reducing the wave height, since in order to get this right, I'm going to need to be able to clearly and easily see how the changes I'm making affect the wave formula, and after that I'll handle the physics side of things. Alright, so I spent quite a bit of time thinking about how I would go about flattening the waves, because there's any number of ways I could do this, but many of them would be extraordinarily inefficient. I was expecting that I'd need to store the water depth around islands in a texture and then make the shader use that to determine how big the waves should be, but I decided to try a much simpler approach first. What I did is simply calculate the distance from the current vertex to the nearest island position, which for now is just set to the world origin. Then I divide that distance by the distance where the island starts to affect the wave height and clamp the value to make sure it doesn't exceed 1. By the way, if I let the multiplier go above 1, the waves start to look like this as you get farther away from the world origin. Looks kinda cool, just, you know, not quite what I'm going for. Anyways, the water around islands now looks like this, and honestly, I don't even know how to explain how stoked I am about this improvement. It's such a small thing, but the calm water in the shallows makes this look like a proper island, instead of whatever this was supposed to be. And again, I'm still just flattening the waves in a perfect circle, but it turns out that that's actually not super noticeable, unless you're actively looking for it. I think at least for now I'll leave it like this, and if it becomes necessary later on, I'll start using textures to make the flattened area match the island's shape a bit better. Of course, this is only the visual side of things. What I'll be working on next is updating the equation that my buoyancy system uses. At the end of the day, this isn't a game about space pirates, aliens, or anti-gravity technology. I also need to apply the wave flattening to all islands, since right now any island that isn't at the world origin still looks like the water just slices through it. One defense of Earth later, the alien pirates have been defeated, and the boat now once again properly floats in the water instead of above it. Along with that, I made sure the camera's submersion detection accounted for the smaller waves in shallow areas, so that should be working nicely again as well. 
The thing is, at the moment I'm looping through all the islands in the scene to figure out which one is closest so that the proper flattening can be applied to the buoyancy formula. Each ship has 6 floaters, which are basically just points at which I calculate buoyancy forces to make it float. This means that for each ship, I loop through all the islands 6 times, 40 times per second, so this is definitely far from efficient. Initially I thought about using trigger colliders to detect when a floating object gets in range of any given island, but after doing a bit of research, it seems that trigger colliders can be very performance intensive, especially when there's a lot of other colliders inside them. From there, I started exploring the idea of setting up a chunking system and using that to limit how many islands need to be constantly checked, but that's a lot of work and I'm lazy. I mean, I ended up deciding that doing so would be premature optimization. It would take quite a bit of time to get a system like that up and running, and just thinking about it was making me want to procrastinate, so I figured it's better if I get it working first and worry about performance a little later, especially if it means that I'll procrastinate less. Plus, there's only 5 islands in the game at the moment, so it's nothing that's going to make the entire game lag or cause my computer to blow up, but once I start adding more islands to the map, I'll definitely need to come back to this. Next up, I think I'm going to make it possible to repair holes in your ship, because right now a single cannonball will sink you, and there's literally nothing you can do about it. Which might as well be a cardinal sin of game dev. Making players feel like they're powerless in preventing a negative outcome is a surefire way to provide a trash experience and make people quit. It's a few hours later, and you can now repair the holes in ships. I did this by essentially using the same system that I built for the resource nodes, like trees and rocks. I made a few modifications and renamed some things to make the code more generally applicable, and of course I was violently assaulted by several bugs, mostly related to dumb mistakes or oversights on my part, but in the end it all worked out. Basically, the whole repairing mechanic extends the functionality of the regular interaction system, with the added restriction that you need to be holding a specific tool or item for the interaction to be allowed. In this case, that's just a plank, for which you obviously need to have planks in your inventory. Although you can't repair a hole without having planks on you, performing a repair doesn't actually use any planks yet, so I think that's the final thing I'm going to work on in this devlog. Okay, so when you repair holes now, it uses up one of the planks in your inventory. This didn't take too long to implement, but I did run into a few more bugs related to repairs along the way. For instance, I had completely forgotten to actually repair the hole on the server side but I was telling clients that it was repaired anyways. Basically, the hole was visually disappearing, but in reality it was still there, and if I hadn't temporarily disabled the flooding mechanic for testing, your ship would continue to fill up with water, even though it would look fully repaired. Anyways, I'm already excited for the next devlog, because I think I'm going to iron out some bugs, and then do my best to get to the point where I can start testing with a few friends. I think that'll provide a great extra source of motivation and accountability, and it's long overdue. With that said, don't forget to smash the like button and keep an eye out for a new networking tutorial in the next few months. Thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you again next time.